Chapter Nine Insight While she was eating breakfast, Ariel queried Jacob on the results of his night long cognitations. I have made a list, Jacob said, of the technical features that gem technology and discrete modulation of hyperwave have in common. Would you like me to project on the screen? Heavens no, Ariel said. I don't understand that stuff. Transmit your list to Kimo over the comlink. See if you can deduce a parallel list that allows him to predict the characteristics of continuous modulation from the characteristics of key technology. Features they would likely share. And tell him I'd like an answer well before we go to the meeting of the aliens. She finished breakfast and stepped out onto the small open balcony to fr sample the fresh smells of the morning and she was assailed instead by the sterile leftover smells from night in a brand new city. Not even the yeasty smell of baking bread that characterized the city of Webster Grove at any time of day, and was certainly to be preferred to the ozone and machine oil of Pearl City. Until that moment she had not really come to grips with how much she disliked cities. She had put up with Robot City and with Earth's Caves of Steel, and now, with this city, just to please Derek, disliking it all the time but kidding herself into thinking she was having a great time. She disliked cities, any city, and she disliked them most in the morning. Without thinking, she had expected to sample the new mown hay of Aurora. Instead, she was oppressed by the smells of a city she disliked intensely, and it was compelled to try to save. The thought of that negotiation, less than two hours away, lay in its anticipation— not like an idea in her mind, but like a brick in her stomach. With her nose wrinkled and breakfast roiling her gut, she turned and went back inside to dress for the meeting. An hour later she was dressed and sitting in the living room, still groping for some solution to the dome problem. Jacob was standing in his niche. She even preferred that in her present mood. She wanted no distractions this morning. Quite edgy, she decided she could no longer wait for Kimo to communicate with her. She needed a solution to take to the meeting, any solution, even one for a minor problem. Jacob, race Kimo on the comlink, she said. See if he's come up with anything on the hyperwave bit. Kimo reports some limited success, Jacob said. He can now see certain features of key teleportation that he had not seen before features that might potentially serve as a method of instantaneous communication, quite unlike current hyperwave communication. Good. Could it be called continuous modulation? Yes, but it modulates a sort of hybrid wave. Since she didn't know what any of it meant. That must be what the aliens are talking about. Let's go, she said. We're well ahead of time. Jacob said. Drive slowly, she said as she walked out of the apartment with Jacob trailing close behind. He had requisitioned a small, non-automated runabout the night before, but not without some difficulty. With the evacuation at its peak, transport vehicles were in short supply. Main Street was bumper to bumper with traffic, but it was all moving so briskly that Jacob, following her instructions to drive slowly, Purred the traffic like a rock in a turbulent river. All eight lanes were flowing northbound to expedite the transfer of material. Still, they arrived at the dome opening at 9.40 a.m., more than twenty minutes ahead of time. At the dome opening, the street narrowed to four lanes and then turned into a dirt road a few meters north of the dome. Buller 9 was already standing visual on the west side of the opening where the meeting with the aliens would again take place. This time she did not plan to make Wooler Nine a participant. Drive on north, Jacob, Ariel said. I don't want to appear anxious. She knew she must sound inconsistent, edgy to leave one moment, reluctant to arrive the next. She had to remind herself that he was just a robot and couldn't care, and so didn't judge her one way or the other. It was a good thing. She already felt inadequate enough. Ten minutes later, Jacob said, "'We are at the halfway turnaround point, Miss Ariel.' She had been deep in her dome problem, still unable to think of anything that could serve to stall the aliens further. The closure of the dome seemed inevitable. "'Fine,' she said, and glanced at him. "'Let's turn around.' 
For just a second, a quick thrill of affection for Jacob coursed through her mind. He was such a handsome hulk and so thoughtful and caring. He was clad in an attractive short sleeved top of loose weave she had picked out. She had selected it for this occasion because of its casualness. She was clad informally as well. She didn't want the aliens to think she was toadying up to them, no matter what, that they might not be able to classify her attire one way or another. It was more a matter of establishing the proper frame of mind in her mind. She reached over impulsively and patted him on the forearm. She put out of her mind the thought that he was incapable of not being thoughtful and caring, incapable of acting otherwise, and programmed so. And he was a handsome hulk. He gave her a quick glance in turn. Is there something else, Miss Ariel? Oh, yes, Jacob, there is. I just hadn't anticipated it back in Aurora when I first asked for your companionship. After all, he was only a robot. She kept telling herself that over and over. Then I can be of further service, Jacob said, questioning. You could, indeed, Jacob. It's just that I can't quite accept that service, no matter how delightful I might find it. And then there popped into her mind the image of Derek, waving, standing far away at the end of a long row of waving green corn. And she wondered where that memory came from. She'd never been in a cornfield with Derek, not that she could remember. And that brought her back to her present responsibility, which was more an obligation to Derek to carry out his wishes, for she had only negative feelings for the robot city otherwise. Still, the obligation remained. "'Do you see any sign of the aliens, Jacob?' she asked. "'Possibly,' Jacob said. "'I see three block bodies that have just descended into a circular flight pattern around the dome. "'Can you time our returns that we arrive just after they have landed? "'I will endeavor to do so.' "'He succeeded. "'She got out of the runabout, walked over to face the aliens, and decided not to bow. "'Jacob stood to one side and slightly behind her. "'Affecting a faint note of haughtiness,' she said, "'Good morning, ambassadors.' "'They'd called themselves leaders the day before, "'but she refused to use that term "'for fear they might misconstrue themselves to be her leaders. "'Good day, madam, Miss Ariel Welsh,' the middle alien said. "'Ariel could not help smiling broadly. "'The Webster Grove accent took her by surprise again, "'but she immediately set her mind to eliminate it from consideration "'so as to avoid the less-than-serious attitude she had briefly lapsed into the day before. "'This is my assistant Laronius,' the middle alien continued, bunching on the right side of what looked like a shoulder in silhouette, "'and this is my third in command, Axonius.' He bunched his silhouette on the left. Ariel responded by her inclining her head in the appropriate directions, as each was introduced. A casual, restrained acknowledgment, short of a pronounced nod, the alien did not use the grand gesture that Sarko had used the day before when he introduced Sinapo, but it still left Ariel wondering whether she was dealing with Sinapo or Sarko. Here she was, on thin ice already, and the meeting had just begun. She guessed that it must be Sinapo. It was he who had dominated the meeting the day before. On the other hand, these others were subordinates. They did not rate the grand gesture, even if this were Sarko. She had nothing with which to parley except the analysis of hyperwave modulation that Jacob and Kimo concocted at her prodding. And if this were Sinapo, and if she had construed properly that his screen flaming the day before was an impatient assessment of Sarko's complaint, then it must have been a trivial complaint on Sinapo's mind, and not much of a bargaining chip for her side. Not knowing for sure whom she was dealing with, she decided to stall. She said, I trust you have now concluded that closing the dome does not have any immediate importance, since it is already 99.2% effective. On the contrary, we feel it would be better to close the compensator and completely enclose any such creations in the future, the alien replied, although the emissions from the creation that Willow 9 causes city have been under control. We are still concerned, for the city may be merely be a harbinger of worse things, yet things that lie off-world and are yet to be inflicted upon us. I can assure you that no such dire things exist. We merely want to share this planet with you, and are quite willing to go to great lengths to ensure our mutual compatibility. That would be more reassuring if it were to come from a leader, 
That would be a member of your He Clan if I downloaded Wooler Nine correctly. Another male chauvinist like Wooler Nine, Ariel thought. This big bat had to be male, clearly. The entire universe was filled with insufferable males. Not necessarily. Women, our She Clan, as you describe them, have often been leaders and able leaders, functioning quite as well as men, our He Clan. But most leaders are still members of the He Clan, is that correct? Yes, Ariel was forced to reply. The discussion was certainly not going well. Ariel decided to risk her only bargaining chip in an effort to turn things around. Without giving the other a chance to respond, she said, But let's get back to the main points of our discussion, the things we have been doing that are disturbing you. We do not wish to disturb you in any way, and are willing to go far to ensure that's not incurred. For instance, we can change our modulation of hyperwave from discrete to continuous so as not to disrupt your listening comfort. A small flame of irritation shot from beneath his eyes, smaller than the day before, but still a respectable, quite noticeable, luminescent green jet. Sarko! He said like he was uttering a curse. That hyperwave and hyperwave and disturbance is not important enough to discuss here. My esteemed colleague is a music lover and prone to give those minor disturbances more attention than they deserve. She had shot her wad, and at the wrong alien. Still, she said, that does show how far we are willing to go to d avoid disturbing your people. That should reassure you t as to our intentions. Proper reassurances can only be supplied by our leader. With strangely mixed emotions, longing and irritation, and ex Inexplicably intertwined, she thought, I am the leader here, Mr. Bat, and you're stuck with me, but I wish my damn partner were here instead of way off cruising down some alien cornfield. She didn't stop to question where that strange image came from, the vision of Derek at the other end of a green, green cornfield. The yearning for Derek was too intense, and then the answer to the dome problem struck her with that marvelous insight that can come only from one brain hemisphere communicating with the other, passing on the subconscious machinations of the one that are hidden from the other. For the first time, she felt in command of the situation. Chapter 10 Neronius Strikes Sinapa was growing impatient with the she-alien. The discussion was coming tedious and unrewarding, and at the same time had not yet provided a suitable circumstance for embarrassing and discrediting his striking subordinate, Neronius. It was becoming more and more obvious that the small alien was in no sense a leader, that Sinapo must somehow contrive to bring to his world a true leader of the aliens. In the meantime, we have to direct Sarko to close the compensator and to start construction of the next one, if, as he suspected, they were beginning to construct a second city on the other side of the Plain of Serenity. Those were the thoughts that had led up to his last remark, and now the small, tedious alien was speaking again. There's no need to bring another leader to this world. You are looking at one. I'd hope to continue with the construction of our city that appears now to be impossible in view of your irrational fear that we may have some insidious and convert plan to irre irrecoverably disturb this planet. The manner and bearing of the little alien had changed. Her voice had taken on a different timbre. Had Nerius noticed the subtle changes? He discounted her attempt to belittle them by use of the adjective irrational. Disparagement was not uncommon diplomatic ploy that was sometimes effective, but not often so, yet still worth the gamble in her case. He recognized that, but would the haughty Neronius recognize her ploy and properly discount it? Or would he let irritation distort his analysis? And would Neronius recognize the subtle changes in her demeanor that were pure telepathy, transmitting information more effectively than the spoken word? We have other more compatible methods of cohabiting you with you on this planet, she continued. The city under the dome in its present state would be essentially deactivated and serve merely as a coordination and communication center for the new effort. She had switched diplomatic techniques, discarding the superior haughty matter, every bit as haughty as Neronius, and was now the companionable, friendly tactician. That was indeed the sign of a genuine leader. 
Would Neronius recognize that and be able to switch tactics himself? She had abandoned her mission's preferred goal, apparently, and was regrouping around an alternative. Again, the sign of a true leader with full authority to make important field decisions. Please describe this compatible method of cohabitation, Sinapo said. Let me first ask a question. Do I, by myself, constitute a weather node? Or my companion Jacob here, or our vehicle with us in it? She had inclined her head toward the servant and pointed to the creation behind her, the vehicle. No, Sinapo replied. None of these entities, singly or together, create a weather node. The thermal disturbance is too small and quickly dissipates. Good, she said. We will switch, then, from an urban energy-intensive model to an agricultural labor-intensive mode, from a centralized society to a dispersed society, from industrial products to agricultural products, from robot cities, which you feel compelled to cover with domes, your node compensators, to robot farms that you will find completely benign. Well, Ronan had not provided the agricultural and farm terminology, so Sinapo could not immediately translate the small alien's words. He had to extrapolate from all of that he had been told by her and by Wooler Nine, and from all the previous data he had acquired by monitoring the alien's hyperwave transmission. But still, it took him only a moment. By agricultural, you mean the intentional cultivation of grasses and other plants like those growing on the plain of Serenity and in the forest of repose, and by farms you mean the lands, subdivisions where this takes place. Is that correct? Yes. The small lane replied, We have been exceedingly patient with your invasions of our world. You did not inquire whether this was a reasonable thing to do, and then negotiate ahead of time a suitable program for doing so. And when it did not prove to be reasonable, we took steps to isolate the disturbance in as minimal way possible. You killed two of our people. Yes. We have been patient beyond any reasonable translation of that word, and now I'm going to ask you to be as patient with us today as we have been with you these many days past. Your patience will be tried, not by violence and death, as ours must, the rituals of our government as they were set up count and counted millennial ago. At that time, an ancient Ceronian philosopher, by the name of Petero, observed that all our levels of government were filled by incompetence. Indeed, government officials rose to their ultimate level of competence, and then one level beyond, where they then remained incompetent, for lack of ability to advance further. The observation was so striking and so self-evident that it became known as Patero's principle, and all government was immediately organized to include the strike factor, whereby any official may be declared incompetent and displaced merely by a subordinate showing greater competence at that higher level. That, by definition, proves that the formal official was incompetent, that is, not as competent as he could have been, and the process of proof, whatever form it takes, is known as striking for the higher position. So, I now turn responsibility for these proceedings over to my subordinate Neronius, so that he may evaluate and respond to your proposal. As he made the last statement, Sinapo graciously gestured in Neronius's direction and carefully watched his subordinate for involuntary reflexes. The body language, the telepathy that would tell him what was going on through his subordinate's mind. And if Axonius were competent for command, he would also be studying the mindset that Neronius would be broadcasting, broadcasting with his body. And Axonius would take that into consideration when he finally rendered his detailed analysis and final judgment of Neronius in a caucus of the Cerebron elite. So in a sense, not only Neronius and Sinapo, but Axonius as well was on, on trial, for it would be the Cerebron elite in caucus who would render the final judgment that would restructure the government of the Cerebrons, if this immediate negotiation proved to be a decisive note in their history. And in that negotiation with the aliens, Axonius must be the tie-splitter, on the spot, if Sinapo and Neronius disagreed. Axonius could be placed in a quite delicate position. He could literally be dumped from the elite if he made a wrong decision, no matter how the contest between Sinapo and Neronius came out. However, Axonius did have one factor going for him. He had nine votes in a caucus that would exclude Sinapo and Neronius. Each member of the elite had votes corresponding in number to his position on the hierarchy. So now, 
All this was surely going through the minds of the other two cerebrons as Sinopo turned from Neronius to obtain his response. The body cast was not good. Neronius radiated confidence, and that must surely have an effect on Axonius, which could make things difficult for Sinopo if Neronius took a contrary course. "'Miss Ariel will. She'll plead a good case for the cause of your people.' Neronius said. Perhaps I do not fully understand all that she has said, but my mentor as an excellent instructor has never failed me thus far, so I am reasonably sure that I understood the gist of your remarks. You radiate confidence and sincerity, and all the other aspects essential to the execution of leadership, so you surely can surely not be found at fault in that regard, and your proposed change to the labor-intensive mode of agriculture seems, on the surface, benign, as you so eloquently describe it. The note compensator is operating at 99.2% efficiency, and that is proved acceptable in Cerebron Caucus, so that point certainly is a point in your favor. And neither you nor your servant taken individually, nor the small collection re represented by one of your loaded vehicles, all small thermal emitters, constitute a weather node, as my mentor has concluded. These are all positive arguments that weigh in your favor. But we must counterpose on the scale that the few negative things which argue against your proposal before we can assess which way the scale finally tips. And surely weighing in against your proposal are the deaths of our two colleagues, and in the particular case of the last fatality, the passive state of our colleague before his death, in tether, a grim way to die without being able to defend oneself. How many more deaths of ceremonies lie in the future? Yet those deaths, which can be largely attributed to misunderstandings by incompetent servants, and the small likelihood of more deaths in the future, do not tip the scale against you. Now we must weigh the true nature of agricultural mode and supporting partially compensated city nodes, and this is where we stumble. We know nothing about the agricultural mode except your reassurance of its serene harmlessness, nor do we know what additional the nations may find their way out of the opening in the city compensator. You term our fears irrational when any rational being, considering your past performance, must judge your actions to be frightening, and such fears to be well founded. We mourn our dead colleagues, and we are ever so uncertain concerning the nature of proposal, so we have no choice but to vehemently oppose your future occupation of our planet. We do not consider your intentions benign, Miss Ariel Welsh, not by a hooked eye. Neronius hunched his wings and fell silent. The fool, Sinapo thought. He's just cast himself from the elite. There's little doubt of that. And just as I suspected, he reacted to the small alien's haughty disparagement, which used the term irrational. It weighed in heavily with the fool's own irrationality, his basic paranoia, which I have long suspected. Thank God for the level-headed, Exonius. Now it was time for Sinapo to cast his own vote. If you agreed with Neronius, you'd only have to say so, and Axonius would be off the hook. For Sinapo to register his opposition, yet only to ask Axonius for his opinion. Which he did. And how say you, Axonius? For the second time that morning, Sinapo felt some misgivings. Axonius's body language showed fear and irresolution when he should have been exuding confidence and decisiveness. C clearly Axonia said, Neronius has properly accessed the situation, has come to a remarkably astute conclusion. Sinapo was stunned. His clever strategy had backfired completely. His attention this past year had been too much on the paranoia of Neronius, and he had failed to properly access Axonius, who had always seemed such a reliable lieutenant. That was where Sinapo had gone wrong, perhaps. The difficulty of properly assessing someone you basically like and who invariably agrees with you. It was a mere formality now. Sinapa was foremost a statesman and a loyal Ceronian, and a politician only when it wouldn't have hurt the tribes. He could have opposed his two subordinates, and the elite might grudgingly have supported him, but then he would have presented to the aliens the picture of a race and a government in disarray. It was more the position of the elite to acknowledge that disarray after the fact, and to show magnanimity toward the aliens and flexibility in their government by reversing the decision of their agents. We agree, then, 
he said. "'It pains me, Miss Ariel Welsh, but your proposal cannot be accepted. In our short acquaintance I have come to admire and respect you, your forthrightness and courage and unfailing good humour. May all those attributes stand you in good stead as you take this painful decision back to your people.' He was finished as the leader of the Cerebrons, unless he could get this decision reversed in caucus, and in a caucus truncated to nine members with the nine votes of Axonius weighing in against him. Wow! Oh, my God. Um, I have no idea anything about Cordell Scotton, but... I feel like the guy needs must be like a political science major or something cuz oh my gosh the amount he goes in depth into that sort of body language and subtle manipulations and everything oh anyway I hope you've enjoyed and have a good rest of your day bye